Welcome back for another video. Today I'm delighted to be taking you through a piece currently on the ABRSM Grade 2 syllabus, namely the Hornpipe by an anonymous composer, meaning we don't exactly know who wrote it, but it doesn't matter. It's a piece I really like to work on with my students because um, it's technically incredibly beneficial. There is a, a lot we can learn and practice here. So, and that's what I want to be exploring with you today. We'll be focusing on um, three main aspects, all of which are right hand related. I will give a little bit of advice about the left hand as well at the end, but mainly we're going to be looking at the right hand. These three aspects are, first of all, the bow stroke, a nice detaché bow stroke, which we'll look at in detail in a minute. Secondly, how to negotiate the numerous string crossings, very tricky subject in this piece. And thirdly, how to use the bow in different ways to create the different dynamics in the piece. Without further ado, let's look at the bow stroke. As I said a second ago, what we are look looking for here is a nice detaché bow stroke. Now, you may or may not be familiar with that stroke. Um, if not, it's high time that we explore it because it's an incredibly important and um, useful bow stroke. Now, there are different types of uh, detaché, but the one most commonly used and the one we're certainly going to be using today uses the middle of the bow. That's what we're going to be looking at today. So I will just demonstrate it. <laughs> which is really moving, and that is my lower arm. My upper arm is nice and calm, and I'm hinging from the elbow. So imagine you're opening and closing a door. That is the same mechanism, a hinge, yeah? It's the same mechanism as our elbow. And when we first start working on that stroke, it can be surprisingly tricky to only to not use the entire arm and involve the shoulder but only hinge from the lower arm so a little exercise i recommend to my students uh, for that is actually without the cello you use your left arm to immobilize your right upper arm and now so you have got this kind of square here and now you just do that so you just realize the range of motion you have without actually using the upper arm. So that's a really good thing to practice on its own. So now we go back to the cello, we start in the middle of the bow and you can see how my lower arm opens. which we want here. You can see there are on these quavers, there are little dots and very, very often students confuse the dots to mean that you should somehow be leaving the string and jumping. There is no jumping in this piece whatsoever. Everything is done on the string and all that dot means you have a little stop. So you just very gently stop the bow in between those quavers and that bow stroke, that letter shade bow stroke runs through absolutely all the semi quavers in that piece and it's really worth practicing that incredibly slowly 
So I'll pick another passage. Monitor here how your arm opens and closes. As soon as you realize there's shoulder involvement, stop. Yes, so. working on that piece because this stroke is so important for us going forward it really pays to practice that incredibly slowly and really invest time into that now let's look at the second aspect the string crossings of which there are many in this piece you can't really go play more than two, three notes here without having to having to cross the string. So that's something we have to really, really, really get into. Now, you may have found that in your practice, it looks and sounds a bit like that. And, you know, your, your, your arm is starting to get tired because there is so much what I call chicken wings going on here, yeah? So if you're furiously going going up and down we don't want that because for that it's too quick and there are too many string crossings so we have to become much more efficient in that that means that we want to minimize our string crossings so we only want to <laughs> as is needed and no more than that and there are there are two really good ways to um, to practice that first of all I want you to explore what it looks like when you look down towards your bridge and you look at your stick and your bow here how much of a seesaw action do you see when you cross the string. Do you see lots of it? You see lots of it? Check how much, how much you can reduce that by. What is strictly necessary? Because when you look down here, you can see there is only about a millimeter when you're on the A string. There's only about a millimeter between your bow hair and the D string. I'm now actually going to show you what it looks like from your perspective looking down. So you just saw that we actually only need very, very, very little movement here to get across. Now, the probably most valuable exercise you can pro possibly do to, um, to improve your string crossings and to really learn the right hand patterns in this piece is to play the right hand alone. So I play the beginning just as normal. <laughs> And now I'm going to do that again, but without using my left hand. If you've never done that before, you will find that surprisingly tricky. This is an exercise which I think my students dread by now because they know it is coming, um, but it is incredibly valuable. Any passage that has lots of string crossings, I'm also mentioning it in some of the videos on the technical work, for instance, in relation to arpeggios where you have lots of string crossings. It is the single most valuable exercise you can do because it strips out 
all the left hand complications, worrying about intonation and everything, you just watch what is actually happening in the bow. And do that really slowly to start with. Shake the... You have the tiniest string crossings possible. Shake that you're hinging from your elbow in the ditter shape. So that's why we're doing that exercise. Once you've mastered it and you put the left hand back in, you will be absolutely amazed at how much of a difference that makes. Last right hand aspect I want to talk about is how to create the different dynamics. So we're starting off at a sort of comfortable mezzo forte. <laughs> Use the middle of the bow and about a sort of hand span width here in terms of the mount of bow. Now, at the end of the fourth bar, we get to piano. Now, how do we do that? Try to simply use less bow here. I'm still using the same stroke, but just not as much length of the bow. Conversely, then you get to the double bar, and we've got four to him. We're doing the opposite here. We're using a little bit more bow than we did at the start. Again, always, always hinging from the elbow. Do not involve the shoulder. Lastly, as promised, one quick bit of advice about um, the left hand. The most important thing here is that you have got a really, really good setup. So that the whole position is, is well established and that as you're playing those semiquavers, you only lift your fingers upwards a tiny bit about the string, no more than a centimeter or so. And under no circumstances should these fingers go out to the side away from the fingerboard. That's when you will really, really, really struggle to play up to speed. So make sure the fingers stay above the string at all times. So that is really important. As usual, if you have any questions about this, please post them in the comment section below and I'll get back to you. And of course, as usual, also I hope that this video has been helpful to you. Um, if you like it, then hit that like button, subscribe to my channel and uh, there are lots more videos coming all the time now. So I would be really happy to see you for another one.